afternoon, everybody. It is good to see you all. Good to, to, to have been able to spend some time and to, to fellowship over lunch with some. And, and uh, just God is good, is he not? Well, that's just sad. Brother Rich says God is good. God is good. That's better. That's better. And all the time, God is good. <laughs> oh, goodness. And when I said earlier that this was the greatest sermon ever preached by the greatest preacher that ever preached, I wasn't kidding. Um, now, the message I'm about to preach is not the greatest sermon ever preached. I'm preaching about the greatest sermon ever preached. Um, and, uh, and I'm just thankful that the Lord gave us these truths and his example. And uh, I, I pray and hope that... Uh, that the Lord blesses this time in his word, uh, that he might instruct us and challenge us and remind us of some of these things. I, I know that uh, there's nothing new under the sun. These aren't any new truths. I'm not digging something out of the word that nobody ever has. And by the way, if anybody ever does, don't listen to him because God doesn't hide those hide truths in his word. For And he, he's not waiting for you to find something nobody else found. Um, the word of God, there's, there's wisdom in many counselors, let's put it that way. And uh, so we've got to be careful of some of those folks that are, are, are looking for hidden messages in Scripture and things. But uh, God gives the Holy Spirit to help us to understand. Um, so we're looking again at Matthew chapter 5. And we've looked at uh, these Beatitudes as Jesus sat down and began to teach his disciples. And he started in verse, verse 3, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for they sh- for they, theirs is the kingdom of God. We talked about several weeks ago what that means to be poor in spirit. Um, it's uh, the opposite of pride. It's humility. Uh, it is uh, but seeing ourselves as we really are. Not a feigned humility, not a, a, a fake humility, but as we see God in his holiness, in his uprightness, in his perfectness, in his righteousness, uh, just like Isaiah and just like Job, even in the, at the end of the book of Job, he, we see ourselves as we are and we see that we are in need of the grace of God. We see ourselves as wicked and, and sinful and deceitful. The, the next verse says, Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. And again, we talked about everyone's sorrows, whether they're children, Christians or whether they're, uh, they're not Christians. Whether they believe in God or not, everyone's sorrows. We all have go through difficult times. We all lose people. And so it's not talking about uh, those that are, are sorrowful because of the situation or the circumstances that they're in. Uh, uh, what he's talking about is a godly sorrow. Paul says in 2 Corinthians, uh, godly sorrow bringeth forth repentance. Once we see ourselves as poor in spirit, once we see ourselves as wicked and sinful, as, uh, and as we stand before a holy, righteous God, we, we, those that mourn over their sin, man, they're blessed. Do you know why? Because we have a God who will forgive us. And it says, in that godly sorrow bringeth forth repentance uh, we, that we mentioned about last uh, a couple weeks ago. Uh, verse 5 says, blessed are the meek. Uh, it's talk, it says, blessed are uh, the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Uh, the, the meek uh, doesn't mean strong, and it doesn't mean weak. It, what it means is those that are yielded. Uh, the word uh, in in that word is the idea of a wild animal that's been that's been tamed. Uh, it's it's uh, not just somebody who is meek when they choose to be meek, but that 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 yielding comes from trusting uh, the the one who's taming you. And listen, uh, as you see yourself poor in spirit, uh, in in wicked and deceitful, you mourn over your sin. You will yield yourself to the Holy Spirit, and you'll yield yourself to God. And we are to do, we are to do that. We do that in, in, our, in salvation even, but we're to do that in all of our life. So we're yielded to God. Uh, verse 6 says, Blessed are they that hunger and thirst. Uh, blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. And it's not talking about hungering for doing good things or being good. Uh, there is no righteousness in any one of us uh, in and of ourselves. Uh, the Bible says there is none righteous, no, not one, but, uh, well, at least not of us. But there was one righteous, amen? His name was Jesus, and, and God has imputed unto us, God has given to us in our salvation the righteousness of Jesus Christ. When God looks at us, he doesn't see our wicked, sinful selves. He sees 
Jesus. He sees his righteousness. So we're to hunger and thirst after Christ and to seek after and to pursue and to, to, to be focused upon that desire as we search for, search for and come to know Jesus more and more. Today we're looking at verse number 7. It says, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Mercy is not just mere sentiment. It's not just the idea of showing somebody uh, a, a, the soft side of us or, or, or not losing our temper. Mercy means more than that. Uh, uh, I used to think of mercy and grace as, 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 like, like this. I used to think of it as mercy not getting what you deserve and grace is getting what you don't deserve. And that's, that there's, there's, that's, that's kind of a surface understanding uh, of mercy. Mercy is so much more than that. It's based upon the goodness and the loving kindness of of our God. It's based upon his very nature. We have a God who is very complex and beyond our understanding. Amen? Uh, uh, his ways are above our ways. Uh, his thoughts are above our thoughts. Uh, we, uh, we, his wisdom is beyond any cute human comprehension. Uh, it, is, it is hard for us to fully understand God. We know there are some things that are revealed to us through, through, through the word of God. And, uh, and we know that those things are about his nature. We know that he cannot act outside of his nature. God can't lie, right? Because he's truth. God, God cannot sin because he's holy. God can't help but be merciful because he's good. Think about that. You and I, when we look at others, we have a choice to make and how we respond in certain situations. It is our human nature, our old man nature, to want revenge, to rejoice in the calamities of, the, of our enemies. Right? How many of you guys have ever had somebody fly by you on the road, and you were hoping that there was a cop just down the road to pull them over? Me too. That's not mercy. Justice, And we have a God who is a God of justice. God's mercy and God's justice are, they're not battling against each other. But they're both eternal and they're both perfect and they're both holy. So how do those two things, which are so, seem to be so against each other, how do they fit in, in his nature? Jesus. Think about it. God is just. In 1 John chapter 1-9, we've been covering 1 John in our, in our uh, uh, Thursday, Thursday Bible studies. And uh, if, you can't, if you're able to come, come. We're, we're having a great time studying 1 John. And 1 John 1-9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Forgiveness is an act of mercy. God is a just God. So when we sin, we stand before a just God, and he must judge us rightly. He can't give us any leeway, any, any which way. He can't say, well, you're, such a, you're, you're a good person. This is the only time you've ever really done this, so I'm just going to let it slide. Does a just judge do that? We want cops to do that when we get pulled over. But a just judge will judge correctly. So if you steal a car or you break the, break the speed limit, you're guilty and you receive the penalty in which you deserve. That's what a just judge does. But that verse says, he is faithful and just to forgive us. How is it just for God to forgive us? Because we broke the law, did we not? For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We all fall under that. There is none righteous, no, not one. Uh, uh, it, it, we, how does God's justice and, and, and that forgiveness come together? It comes together in the person of Jesus Christ. When Jesus Christ died on that cross, what does the Bible say about uh, those accusations that were against us? They were nailed to the cross. He bore our sin. We use this, these phrases all the time, but, but it's important for us to really think through what it is we're saying. Because you can throw these phrases out, but if you don't know what it means, somebody can come along and confuse you on this. Young people, pay attention to this. Old people, pay attention to this. And everybody in between, pay attention to this. See, I didn't say anybody was young or old. I just said all of you, pay attention to this. It's important for us to know this. 
It is absolutely important for us to understand that, yes, God is just, and all sin, the Bible says, it is appointed a man once to die, and after that, the judgment. Jesus said in John chapter 3 that he didn't come to condemn the world, but, but that the world was already condemned. Why? Because sinful. That, that condemnation was already there. But, but Paul says in Romans chapter 8, there is now no condemnation. How can there be condemnation already, but no condemnation? Again, it comes back to Jesus Christ. We can have forgiveness. Girls, pay attention. No talking. We can have forgiveness. We can, have, we can be forgiven. Because, and, and Jesus is faithful and just to do it because of what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. I don't know about you, but that makes me happy. So it's not just a sentiment or sentiment. It's not just a thought or a feeling. It, it, it's, it's not seeing somebody hurting and in trouble and weeping for that person. I feel bad because they did this, even though it was a result of their choices. That's not mercy. It's not mercy at all. Mercy is compassion in action. Compassion in action. It's God seeing us as sinful, knowing that we were going to sin. Was it Romans chapter 5, or five I think 5, 8 says, but God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God saw us in our sin even before you we were born. God knew the sin Every sin, every dirty, filthy, nasty, wicked thing. And the, the little kids are thinking, I'm not, not any, anything dirty, nasty, wicked, or filthy. Just wait, you will. And even beyond that, God sees your nature, which is dirty, wicked, filthy, and nasty. How many of you guys have lied? Just be honest, all of you. Uh, everybody raise your hand, because if you're not raising your hand, you're a liar. <laughs> finally, finally uh, uh, James says, okay, yeah, I lied. I lied about lying. Nobody had to teach you that. You didn't have to hang around a, a liar to learn how to lie. It was just your nature. But God, in his mercy, sent, sent the Savior to pay for your sin. Jesus died for your sin. That's, that's God's compassion and action. And that mercy is based out of God's goodness. Look with me, if you would, to Lamentations chapter 3. Lamentations chapter 3, 22 and 23. This book was written by Jeremiah who was known as the weeping prophet, and he lamented a lot. Verse 22 says this, It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed, because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning, and great is thy faithfulness. Think about this for a second. This quality of Christ, this quality of God, is one of the most beautiful characteristics of God. It links God's mercy to his compassion. It it means it it is not just a feeling that we have for somebody in the situation they're in. It's not the feeling God has for us. We know that God loves us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Uh, Man, people... People quote that verse, uh, they learn it in Sunday school, they learn it in Awana, and people grow up knowing that verse. And they say, God loves us. Yes, he does. But God, God saying that he loves us in his word would mean absolutely nothing if he didn't show it to us. Right? I love my wife. I could tell her, in fact, I told her when we first, when we first uh, were dating, I said, I, you deserve to be told that I love you every single day. And I, I've done a pretty good job. I, I think I, I, I can't remember a time when I've missed telling her that I love her. But telling her that I love her and loving her, which is an action, are two different things. 
Well, she said one of the things that, that she has learned over this last, this last month and with the injury is, is how much love she's surrounded by, not just from me, but from people in our church and, and brothers and sisters in Christ and the people that don't just say, I, you know what, I hope you feel better. I'm praying for you. We've all said that, right? And how many times have we forgotten to pray for the people that we said we were going to pray for? I'll be honest. A lot of times I'll say that, and then I'll say, hey, can I pray for you right now so I don't forget? Sometimes I'll, I'll say that, and I'll, I'll forget to write it down, and I'll forget. Listen, uh, real love is an action. And again, God's mercy is shown to us through his compassion in Jesus Christ. I can't get away from that. I, it's all about Jesus. God looks at his mercy with compassion. Again, look at that verse again. It says, it is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. Notice, uh, it, it's not because we deserve not to be consumed. That whole consumption thing, that whole being consumed thing, is the result of our sinfulness. Go back in the book of Genesis and Noah and all the things that happened there. Right, the, the flood and everybody died. People today would say, well, it's just not fair. God was wicked and evil. Why would he do that? If that was God, then I don't want him to be my God. He was just to do what he did. Because the people were against God and rejecting him. And it says, in their heart was evil continually. He was just to do what he did. But he was also merciful with Noah. And Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. That grace was, was, was God's mercy. He was not destroyed with everybody else. And he was given a lifeline. Say, well, well, that's that's good. Well, he didn't deserve it, did he? No. Now he was a righteous man. He was a good man. He he. Uh, we know that because it talks about him uh, about how he how he worshipped the Lord. But he didn't deserve God's grace, even though he was righteous. He received God's grace. Remember, grace is undeserved. Favor. Even though he was righteous, even though he prayed, even though he sacrificed, he still did not deserve the, the grace of God. He deserved judgment like everybody else. So God's mercy is linked to his compassion. Uh, every morning we wake up, we see new mercy of God. You ever had a bad day? I have. I've had bad weeks. I had about three bad years. God should have killed me. I'm not kidding. If I was God, I'd have been dead a long time ago. Well, you know what I mean. I would have judged myself much harshly than God did. But God in his mercy, God in his mercy chose to show me grace. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassion fails not. You know what that means? God's compassion doesn't fail, neither will his mercy. His mercy will not fail. Remember, God is not finite like you and me. You ever shown mercy up to a point and then finally, like, you know what, I just can't take this anymore. I'm done. I'm finished. That's us. We are finite. We only have so much patience before we snap. Some people's, some people's, uh, tempers are shorter than others, although, as we know from the fruit of the Spirit, love is joy, peace, long-suffering. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, 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 gentleness, goodness, faith, right? But God is infinite. While we are finite and our, our, our compassion for others is finite, there is a limit to it, there is no limit to God's mercy. Jay, you know what that means? You mess up. Let's phrase that. You sin. I, hate, I say that all the time. I don't mean that. I, I, it's I, something I used to say. I'm trying to break myself of it. You don't mess up. As a Christian, messing up is not an option. You choose to sin or not to sin. The Word of God has given us everything that we need, right? He's given us all the instruction. You may not read, read the instruction manual you know, like most men, um, and they fail at putting stuff together. God's Word is, is an instruction to us. You sin and then you sin again, and then you sin again, and guess what? God will continue to forgive you because his mercies fail not. 
For three years, I walked in sin. And I don't mean, I don't mean that I, you know, I made a mistake here or I slipped over here. I, I lived in sin. And I'm ashamed of that. I wish I, didn't have, I wasn't able to give this testimony. I wish that I could say because I grew up in a Christian home, I did everything that was right and I followed God the whole time. I did not. But that day that I chose, the day that God brought me back, the day that I humbled myself, that verse in James chapter 4 is absolutely true. But God giveth more grace. We sing this song about God's grace. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that is greater than all my sin. And God's grace and mercy is so amazing. It is infinite, never ending. It is new every morning. I don't know about you, but I'm thankful for that. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4. It says, but God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love, wherewith he loved us. That passage is talking about our salvation. This is what we used to be. We were dead and our trespassing sins, and that's where God found us. But notice what it says. What is God rich in? But God, who is rich in mercy. He does, listen, he ha- owns all the cattle on a thousand hills. He owns the gold and the platinum and the silver and all the precious metals, the diamonds, the sapphires, all of that. It belongs to him. He created it all. If somewhere, uh, somebody were to come in here with a check for $50 million, we would celebrate because, hey, we're rich. That doesn't count that as rich. Back during the gold rush, people would leave everything to go dig in a mountain somewhere, hoping to find a little bit of gold. And I used to think gold was pretty cool. And it is, because it, it's worth some money. When you get to heaven, if you're, all, if you're all caught up in gold, do you know what you'll be doing? Shoveling it off the roads. There's, there's a joke about a man who, who uh, wanted to be buried with, with the gold that he had saved up in his lifetime. And, and so his family, his family put it in the casket with him. And when he gets to heaven, uh, uh, he, said, they, he, they said, he walks up to the gate. And this is a joke. This isn't actually how things work in heaven. He walked up to the gate, and Peter's standing there. And he says, listen, I know they say that you're born with nothing, and you can't take anything with you when you go to heaven. But I brought this, I brought this, this box with me. It was the most precious thing. Can I bring it into heaven? And, and Peter said, sure, why not? And Gabriel looks over at him and says, why did you let him do that? He goes, it's just asphalt. But I'm bum. It's nothing. What was God rich in? Mercy. He, had an, he has an overabundance, a wealth of mercy. And it is that mercy that we have received which has brought us to salvation. Ephesians 5, 1 says, be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. It means we are to be imitators of God. We are to be imitators of Christ. First John says that, we're to, that we are to walk as Jesus walked. That that is a, 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 that is a, 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 a test, uh, a proof of our salvation. First John chapter 2. We covered, we covered that last, this last week in a Bible study. We're to walk as he did. It means we, we do the very best that we can. Now, who, who in here can live like Jesus did? I'm going to put my hand down because I can't either. Who in here is supposed to try to? I uh, use this illustration in Bible study. It, it's like this idea uh, when, when, I was a, uh, when I was younger and my father would be walking ahead of me, there were t- a few times when I tried to step walk in his actual footsteps except for his legs were a lot longer than mine. And I would try, I'd jump from step to step, and I'd fall down because I could not do it. 
That is the same picture of us as children of God. We're to walk as Christ walked. We're to be imitators of God. We're to do as he did. But in our inability, we're only to try. God knows our weaknesses. God knows the limits of our abilities. And God also strengthens us and leads us and guides us. So yes, you're going to stumble, and yes, you're going to fall. But we are to be imitators of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, knowing that, knowing that we're to imitate God, we're also to imitate him in his mercy. We are to, be, we are to, we are to imitate him in, in what well, they say, uh, imitation is, is the sincerest form of flattery. It's a, it's a different word I'm using for imitation. But um, we're, we're to be, and, or try to be, and allow God to work in us to be as much like God as we can, as much like Jesus. And the more like God we are, the more godly we are. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's, as, we, as we begin to, to, to show in our lives the nature of God, that divine nature that's been given to us through salvation, uh, the more holy, the more godly we are. So we're to do that. Jesus teaches a, a parable in, in Luke chapter 10. If you don't mind, turn there with me. Luke chapter 10. Jesus is speaking a parable, or teaching a parable to a man who, well, asked him a question. Verse 25 says this, And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? And he answered and said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy strength and with all thy mind and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said unto him, Thou answerest right, this do, and thou shalt live. Now stop there for a second. Could, is there any way that that man could have done those things on his own? No. It, it's just like the, 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 young, the young man who came to, came to Jesus and said, What must I do? And he said, follow the law. He says, I've done all that since the day I was born till now. And he said, then go and sell everything that you have. Uh, would selling everything, and, and then come follow me, would selling everything he had have saved him? No. What was Jesus doing? Using the law to show us where we fall. So here this, this man is tempting Jesus, and he says, he says, what must I do? And he says, the, he said, what do you think the law is? He says, do that. And, 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 and here, what's the response of Jesus? Uh, or verse, look at verse 29. Uh, the first man says in verse 20, and he said unto him, thou hast answered right, this do and thou shalt live. Verse 29 says, but he, willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, who is my neighbor? This lawyer, uh, this man got the answer correct. He was tempting Christ, trying to trip him up in what, what, what to say. He was testing, testing him, and, and, he, and he got the answer right. This was, this, was, uh, this was true. He said, to follow the Lord thy God, to love the Lord thy God, with all the heart, soul, and mind, love your neighbor as yourself. But even though he knew the truth, where was his destination to be? Hell. There are a lot of people that know how to get to heaven, but that's not where they're headed. Kind of sad and scary. There are people in church today that sat under preaching, and they'll spend eternity apart from God. We're not saved by the plan of salvation. We're saved by the one who it's about. We're saved by Christ. Luke chapter 10 Verse 29, the man willing to justify himself said unto Jesus, who is thy neighbor? Remember, he was supposed to love his neighbor. And he says, well, who is that? That question shows us a couple of things. One, he wanted to limit those that he had to love. You tell me who I have to love and I'll love them. Listen, you do that, there are another... Seven billion people on this earth that you can ignore, right? Well, what did Jesus teach him in this following parable? Not only did he not love those he was supposed to love, he also didn't 
want to show mercy to anyone he didn't want to show mercy to. Verse 30 says this of chapter 10. And Jesus answering said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion on him and went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring oil and wine, and he, sat, and he set him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And, one, on the, and on the morrow, when he departed, he took out two pence and gave them to the host and said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Which now these three thinkest thou was the neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves." Jerusalem was, was uh, the holy city. It was set up on a hill, uh, separate. There's a valley uh, kind of around it. It was a great place of defense. There was a wall around it. Not, not, not all of it was there in, in Jesus' time, but it was, it was, it was a, a beautiful, beautiful place. Uh, it was a protected place. And people would go down, and when they would leave there, there was an area where there was not so much protection. Thieves would hide there. It was a, it was a dangerous place. When Jesus entered into the city, uh, the, the, the people in Jerusalem saw him for a great period of time because as he came down that winding trail and the, the people were shouting, Hosanna! Everybody in the city could hear and see. It was, uh, they, they got to see that. So the, there was, a, there was a places there for thieves to hide. And in this parable, uh, that's exactly what happens. The, 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 this man's going through and uh, somebody, says, uh, apparently somebody that wanted something that he had, beat him nearly to death and took everything, including his clothes. Now, in this story, three men pass by. It says, it says there, it says the verse, now I got, lost my place. I had to go back to it. It says, it says there in verse, uh, verse 31, and by chance there came down a certain priest that way. And when he saw him, he passed by. And here's a religious man man who claims to love God and follow the law. What was that law again? Love God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And what was the other part of it? Love your neighbor as yourself. Here's the problem. The man on the ground was a Samaritan. Now, who are the Samaritans? The Samaritans are not Jews. They're half-Jews. See, when, when, uh, when God sent, sent the enemy in to, to loot and plunder and kill, take captive uh, the people of Israel, not everybody was taken captive. There were, there were certain uh, people that were left there, left behind. And not, then not only did, did the Persians t- take captives, uh, but they also left some people there. Some of the Persians. So you had a mixed breed. Uh, there were some that were they, were, they had been Jews, but now they were half Jews and half, half Gentiles. And the Jews have an issue with the Gentiles. Right? And they have a, a bigger issue with the Samaritans. They, they want to worship someplace else. They want to follow different laws. And, and, and it, was, it, was, it was so such a, a, a hatred of the Gentiles that it was, if they had to go to a place where they should walk through, that was the shortest path, they'd take the longest path around it. That's why it was in, in uh, John chapter 4, Jesus said, I must needs go through Samaria. He had a purpose to go through there. The disciples said, why are we going there? It was the shortest route. I don't know about you, I like the shortest route. But it took them through a, a bad neighborhood, and they didn't want to go. So here you have this Samaritan, one that the Jews hate, and here you have this, this priest who loves God and follows the law, except for the law that says, love your neighbor as yourself. And he sees that poor Samaritan beaten and bloody and unconscious on the side of the road, clothes taken from him, food taken from him. He had nothing. And instead of having mercy and compassion based out of his love for his neighbor, what did he do? I'm going to walk over here on the other side of the road and not get myself dirty with that dirty, dirty man. The man wasn't a Samaritan. He was a Jew. Sorry. Who's the next one to go by? A Levite. 
Same. Levites were keepers of the law. They, they represented the rules. And while the law can describe and condemn us, the, the law does not redeem us. The law is to be our schoolmaster, to show us where we fall and where we fail. Uh, and it does point us to our Redeemer, but the law does not redeem us. In fact, Paul said in Galatians, if you're redeemed by the law, then, then what use it was there for Christ to die? We, we can't be redeemed by the law. It only shows us where we fail. I'm not sure why that Levite ignored him. Maybe he just thought he got what he deserved. A man who's all based of living his life based upon the law may have thought, you know what, he probably deserved that. I don't know. Sometimes we do that, don't we? We look at people and judge, and judge them and say, you know what, that, that home, they don't deserve that $5 I got in my pocket because they're just going to use it on drugs or alcohol. Maybe. They deserve to be there. No, they don't. The third person to come by, according to Jesus, was a Samaritan. Now again, as I mentioned, the Samaritans and the Jews did not get along. But that Samaritan in this story represents the Lord Jesus Christ. The Samaritans are rejected, are they not, by the, by the Jews? Hated by the Jews. What does the Bible say in Isaiah about Jesus? He was rejected of men. He came unto his own, and his own received him not, right? Jesus was rejected by the Jews. He was despised. He comes along, and he sees the man. Now, he didn't know him. He'd never seen him before. It was somebody that, if he had seen him, probably would have rejected him. Walked on the other side of the road. But he, seeing this man in his need, what did he do? Pour oil on his wounds. He bandaged him up. Carried him to a place to rest and to heal. Paid for somebody to, to take care of him as he was gone and said, I'll pay the rest of it when I get back. He showed him real mercy, real compassion. Jesus did the same thing for us. It's a perfect picture of salvation. He found us dead in our trespasses and sins. Filthy, wicked, nasty, disgusting, as bad as it can get. That's what he found. The God who is rich in mercy, wherewith he loved us. He, he did something in our lives. He sent his son to die on the cross. It cost Jesus. Our redemption doesn't cost us. It cost Christ. He healed us. He cleansed us. In the account the man poured oil on his wounds, Jesus Christ has given us the Holy Spirit. It's a beautiful picture of the mercy of God. Verse 36 says, Which now these three, thinkest thou, was the neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? 37 says, and he said, he that showeth mercy on him. Then Jesus said unto him, go and do thou likewise. Christ has shown us mercy in the fact that he died for us. Here in his love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Remember, mercy is a outflowing of love. It's compassion and action. Jesus it didn't just say that he loves us. He showed us that he loved us. Now, back to Matthew chapter 5. It says, blessed are they that are merciful. Blessed are they that are merciful. We are to show the same kind of mercy and compassion to those that are around us, whether, whether they're family or friends, whether they, they deserve it or not. We need to learn that same message of mercy. 
not with the indifference of the priest and the Levite, not with the sin and the iniquity of those that beat the man, but with the involvement in others' lives that Jesus calls for. There are three types of people in that, in that story. There are those who beat him up. They saw what he had, and they said, I think I deserve that, and they did the damage. And there are people out there that hurt others. There are Christians out there, or those that profess Christ, that hurt others. They, they knock them down with their words or their actions, their ignorance. They deserve what they got. No, if they deserved what they got, they deserve the same thing you would have gotten. They deserve to be in hell, but God, who is rich in mercy. They look at somebody at their past or their background, and they judge them on that. They judge them on the way that they look, their tattoos or their haircut or, or their lack of one. The, 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 whatever their t-shirt has to say. We, we saw a young man today uh, that, uh, uh, that had, had a pin on his shirt. He said, these are my pronouns. We can judge those things and say, well, he deserves whatever he gets. Or they do. Depending on the pronoun. Now that doesn't mean we have to agree with the sinfulness. That's not what I'm saying. But they deserve love and mercy just like we do. but not just from God. Because God will give it. The lesson here is that we have mercy like Christ does. That we don't look at them and judge them as they are. We look at them as a soul that needs to be saved. There are those that beat up or injure others. There are people that have been bruised and battered. And there are people out there that are broken and hurt. I'm so thankful that the word says that he came to, to heal the brokenhearted, to heal our wounds, because he's done that for you and me in salvation. But he came not just for you, came for them. There are many people that have turned off from Christianity because of the way they're treated by Christians. Brother Donnie was mentioning the Crusades, how they, they were talking with the kids and the, about the Crusades. And the, the, those people that were, if you know anything about the Crusades, uh, the religious people in power thought they were doing the right thing in the name of God, but instead they were trying to force Christianity onto a people that did not want it. People were murdered, uh, people were killed, uh, lands were conquered, all in the name of God. That is not how God wants us to conquer this world. Not by brute force, not by making them like Americans. There are a lot of missionaries today that unfortunately are going over and just trying to Americanize the, 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 the cultures that they're going to. Listen, it, it, you're not a Christian if you live like an American or dress like an American. You're Christian if you trust Christ for your salvation. So they don't need to be Americanized. They need the gospel. In fact, it's better. I really appreciate the, the help ministries and how many of the uh, of the, these men that we support that are national pastors, they, grew, they live, they know the culture. They're not trying to go and change them to our culture. They're just trying to preach the gospel. There are people that grew up in church that are no longer in church because of the way they were treated. There are those that pass by. They see the problem. You can't ignore it. But for whatever reason, they, they think somebody else will take care of the issue. Somebody else is going to be the one to share the gospel with that person. Somebody else is going to be the one to come along and help that one up or, or bind that one's wounds. Listen, we know that Jesus is the one that truly heals and he's the only one that can. But guess what I found in scripture? He uses people every time. He doesn't need preachers. 
Don't think God has a voice. He, uh, when Jesus was baptized, uh, a voice from heaven thundered and said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And everyone heard it. When, when, when Moses brought the Israelites to, to Mount Sinai and, and to brought the, pe- the people of Israel to God, they heard the thunderous voice of God and they were terrified and said, Moses, you go talk to him from now on. We don't want to hear that anymore. We might die. God can speak. God used Moses. God used Abraham. God used Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Paul, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Jeremiah. God uses people. And guess what? He'll use you too. can't pass by anymore. This world is dying and going to hell because God's people are walking by. We can't sing loud enough to drown out the screams of those that are dying and going to hell. The Bible says that, that the mouth of hell is getting wider every day. There are over 7 billion people on this planet right now and the vast, vast majority will spend an eternity in hell. Say, well, I can't reach 7 million people. You're right. You can't. So let's just not do anything. There's an illustration of a little boy, and he's walking on the beach, and this man's watching him. It's kind of weird, men watching little boys. Don't do that. But for the purpose of the illustration, he, he's seeing this little boy walking, and there's starfish all over the beach that washed up in the storm. And he grabs, he grabs a, a fish, and he throws it into the water and finds another fish, and, or starfish, and throws it in the water. And the man says, what are you doing? He goes, I'm trying to save the starfish. And he looks at the fat little thousands of starfish that are washed up. He goes, son, there is no way that you can, that you can save the starfish. He goes, I can save this one. I can say this one. You may think that you can't have a ministry big enough to make an effect, to have any kind of effect on eternity. But can I tell you this? It isn't your ministry. It's God's ministry. One person could be saved. Uh, you could lead one person to the Lord. That would be the only person you ever, you ever lead to the Lord. You will not know until you get to heaven the benefit that takes place from that one time. And listen, you may not even get to, to be the one to, to, to see them pray. You might just hand them a track. You might just read them a Bible verse. You might say, I'm praying for you. You might hand them one of those cards that we passed out this morning and say, listen, you can pray. Listen, you don't know what kind of impact that you could have. Because that one act of obedience and witness can affect an entire generation. D.L. Moody, we all know his name, correct? You know he wasn't saved by some pastor or preacher? He was saved by, well, he he was saved by Jesus, but he was witnessed to by his Sunday school teacher who was concerned for him and went to his place of work and said, uh, said, Dwight, I'm praying for you, and I'd like you to be saved. He, was a, he, was, he worked for a cobbler, and he got saved that day. Now, we, don't know, we know his name. I don't know his name. But I can find it for you. There's no record of him doing anything else for the Lord other than teaching that Sunday school class. But D.L. Moody, there is a college that bears his name. He was an evangelist and a pastor, and thousands were saved under his ministry. Never would have happened if that one Sunday school teacher hadn't taken a few moments of his day and said, Dwight, I'm praying for you. You don't know what your ministry, don't walk past, don't ignore it, don't think, I can't do anything. You're right, you can't do anything. None of us can do anything. But by prayer and through the power of the Holy Spirit, we can see an entire nation turn back to God. You say, well, that's just impossible. For us, yes. For God, no.
each one of us are part of that category. You might be here today and kind of broken. We've had people in our pews that are broken. Maybe not necessarily on the outside, but broken and hurt and wounded on the inside. They put on a good front for others, but they're broken. Maybe you're here and you're one of the ones who, well, beats up on other people. Maybe you're here and you're just one who passes by. You ignore the problem, you pretend it doesn't exist, or you busy yourself with life. That's, we're not called to be any one of those. As children of God, Jesus heals your wounds. Jesus will strengthen you and help you. But as a child of God, he calls you to be merciful, to love others as he loved us. Look at Psalms 85, verse 10. Psalm chapter 85, verse 10. Verse 10 says, Mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. There cannot be real mercy without truth. It must be rooted in truth because mercy does not minimize sin. Mercy does not minimize sin. See, there are a lot of people that will just minimize the sin and pretend that that's real mercy. We'll accept them into fellowship, we'll allow them to come and be a part of a church, and, and we'll just pretend like, like what they, the way they're living and the, way, uh, the, the choices they have made aren't a problem. We accept everybody. But as a church, can we accept everybody? God says that there's going to be a separation. Now, I'm not saying they can't come in. I'm not saying they can't, be, they can't be a part of our services. But there is a separation. There is a difference between a lost person and a saved person. If we're just going to ignore the sin, that is not mercy. Mercy is in knowledge of the truth of our sin or their sin. Compassion is still shown. Mercy is the withholding of judgment. The withholding of judgment. God does not deal with us on the basis of fairness, but on the basis of mercy. You ever hear the phrase, well, that's just not fair. It's not f- this is just how I am. God should accept me for the way that I am. He loves you the way that you are but he does not accept our sin. That's why Jesus died. That's why we see his mercy. There's, I heard this illustration years years ago, a college professor um, uh, trying to to help his students understand fairness and grace and mercy. He, He gave them a test. Some did very well, and others, in fact, a lot of them, failed. He says, he says, I'll tell you what, I'm going to show you mercy. Those of you that failed the test, I'm going to give you the same grade that the, 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 the person who got the best grade got. The class was ecstatic, right? Those that got F's and D's, and C's, they all got A's. They were excited. The next, the next test came along and something happened. Because of what he had done previously, fewer people studied for the test. And so they didn't get A's this time. This time they got like a B minus. But they also passed and everybody was okay with it. The next time came another test and This time, nobody studied for it, and everybody failed. And he said, well, you'll get the same deal. You you all get the, the highest grade, and the highest grade was an F. Well, that's just not fair. 
No, what's fair would have been that those of you failed would have gotten F the first time and the second time. Mercy is not getting what you do deserve. Not getting what you do deserve. Grace is getting what you don't deserve. We, 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 many times we think that, well, it's just not fair. We're looking for fairness. We expect others to be fair to us, that we get what we deserve. But the truth is, if we got what we deserved, and we got what was truly coming to us, we would all be in hell right now. If what, if what we're looking for is fairness, we're never happy. God is just and merciful. The justice of God says that sin must be punished, and once we see that truth, we then cry out for mercy. The law shows us, and the word of God shows us, that we fall short of the glory of God. God, in his mercy, through the word, saves us. He is just to, to judge us. He is merciful to redeem us. If we refuse the, the shed blood of Christ, there is absolutely no hope for us. The fact that the most of the world rejects Jesus Christ means the result will be that they'll spend an eternity in hell. It's a sad state. The God in his mercy gave us, gave us his son. He gave us his word. He's given us his spirit. Are we showing the mercy that God has shown us? Back to Matthew 5. Verse 7. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. There is blessing showing mercy. Now this doesn't mean that we're forgiven because we show mercy. We're forgiven because of the mercy of God. But it does mean or show us is that the more mercy we show, the more mercy we receive. We show mercy because we've received it. God shows us more grace and more mercy. Listen, his, his mercy is, is infinite. But do you remember what Jesus said about teaching when he taught the disciples to pray? That we're forgiven as we forgive others? That's literal mercy. We're to show mercy. He says, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Psalms 18.25 tells us, With the merciful thou wilt show thyself merciful. James 2.13 says, For he shall for he shall judge, for he that shall have judgment without mercy, that hath showed no mercy, and mercy rejoice against judgment. We cannot give mercy until first we have received it. To do that, we need to go back to the very beginning. We need to be poor in spirit. We need to mourn over our sin with a contrite heart. We need to yield ourselves to the Holy Spirit. Remember, mercy is an outflow of love. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. The truth is, we'll never be able to show the mercy of God until the Spirit of God is in control of our lives. We watched, my wife and I, uh, Anita had posted a video of Rich's Grinning. You guys watched the same movie, didn't you? It's, a, it's, it's about a woman named S Sabina. Last name was Wormbrand. Very weird last name. 
might have heard of her husband. He wrote a book called Tortured for Christ. He was an atheist, got saved. The, the movie is about their life. He, he was, uh, uh, they, were, they were Jews, but he wasn't a practicing Jew. And, but eventually he became a Christian. But because of the history, during, the, during the, the Nazi occupation, they were arrested and tortured and arrested and tortured. They, they, would, hide, they would hide really anybody. They were trying to protect others. Sabina, his wife, her family were Jews that were taken in the cap, in the cap, into captivity, and they were killed at, a, uh, at one of the camps on the, on the, the border. In the movie, a man came, comes into the town. He was, I believe it's Ukrainian or Poland, I don't remember, whatever, whatever country they were in. He was from there, but he was a Nazi. And he'd gone to the border and was bragging about all the Jews that he had murdered there. To everybody that would listen and to those that didn't want to listen because they were all afraid of him. He, li- he was staying with, with uh, the Wormbrand's neighbor. And uh, so... so uh, her husband goes to his house. He's dr- the guy is drunk, and and uh, he invites him over to the, his own apartment, and he begins to try to witness to him, to share him of him the love of God and how God can, can can show mercy to us, how He does show mercy, and how in that He changes us. He goes, "How can I believe that this is even true?" He said pointing at the other room, as in the middle of the night, he said, in that room is my wife. And she is a Jew. And her parents were at that camp where you were at. Her parents were murdered, possibly, probably by you. He said, let's have a little test. He said, I'll go in and I'll wake up my wife. And I'll tell her that the man who murdered her family, her mother, her father, her sisters, is here. He said, she will come out, and she will make you the most wonderful meal and be as hospitable and caring as she can be. He said, that's impossible. He got up, walked in the room, told his wife. She didn't say anything. She got out of bed. She walked up to the man in the other room. She hugged him. She kissed him. And she said, Christ has forgiven me. How can I not forgive you? That man came to Christ. Because one who received mercy showed mercy. God calls us to be merciful. Not proud and arrogant and forcing the, the, the gospel down people's throats. We are to preach it. But we can't force them to get saved. We can't beat them into submission with the Bible. What we can do is show them the love of God that he has shown to us and share with them the same gospel, the same good news that we received. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. The worm brands spent their time there, not just reaching that man, but many Nazis, to be honest. The story in the movie, the way it's framed around, she's telling the story to three Germans who are hiding from the Russians who came to liberate the country. Because those men were likely to die. It's the, the officer that's there, they, they bring them clothes to change into. They're hiding them because the Russians come to the house all the time. and They're hiding them in the garage. And, and, uh, and she's telling them this story. And, and the officer did not want to follow them. He, he said, this is a trap, this is a setup. How did you get this information? One of, the, one of the men under him said, somebody told me. 
And he says, who told you about this family? And the man that Sabina had embraced, the one who'd gotten saved, walked out of the house. He goes, I'm the one that told her, or told him. And they left. Question. In that account, or in that parable that Jesus told, who are you? Are you the are you the one who's wounding and hurting? I hope not. Are you the one that's wounded and hurt? If you are, Jesus can heal and repair and redeem you. Most often, we're the ones that walk by and ignore. But that's not mercy. Or are you the one that comes alongside and shows the love of God? God's forgiven us. We are to forgive others. We have received mercy. We're to show mercy. Not say it, not feel it, but show it. God's love was not just talked about, it was revealed and the sacrifice of Christ. How is your love, God's love, shown through you, going to be shown this week? Do you have a choice? Every day is another choice. Every day we receive the mercy of God. Praise the Lord for that. But how are you going to show the mercy of God to others this week? You choose how you're going to treat others. You choose how you're going to pray for others. You choose how you're going to show mercy. May God help us. Father God, I thank you for this day. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for the mercy that you've showed us, Lord. You have been so good to us. We don't deserve any of it. What we deserve is judgment, but God, you sent your son to save us, and we thank you for it. Lord, you you don't just tell us how to be saved. Lord, you don't just tell us what we need to do. You did it for us. Your spirit draws us to you. You redeem us. You cleanse us. You change us. God, I pray that you'd help us to walk as Christ walked, that we might show forgiveness and mercy and love just like we've received. Lord, I pray that in all that, it would bring honor and glory to your name. It would bring others to Christ, that we might not just be a, an organization of a church, but Lord, we would be the church, your church. We ask for your help, Lord, because we need it. In Jesus' precious name, amen.